I'm Elvin Lee Shields. Now, the Lee part. Most of my brothers and sisters have a middle name of Lee. When you were growing up in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and born in, in those times, I was born on Melrose Plantation in December 1948. Believe it or not, we were still part of the Confederacy in 1948. Everybody who grew up on a plantation, you had to pay homage to Robert E. Lee. And you'll find a lot of black people born during Jim Crow in the 30s and 40s and 50s was naming their children Lee. A lot of them changed it to Lee Roy. You'll find a lot of blacks named Lee Roy. It wasn't never Lee Roy, it was Lee. They changed it to Lee Roy because they didn't want to honor Robert E. Lee. And I said, okay, Lee. So that's part of my middle name, which I never used, I just used DL. But a lot of my brothers and sisters have Lee in it because we all were born on plantations. And if you're born on a plantation, you go along to get along back then because that was during the time of Jim Crow. It was still slavery. Illegal, but it was still slavery. But anyway, I was born in December 1948 at Melrose Plantation. I was the youngest boy, but there are three young girls below me and then the rest of above me. So it was like seven older than me. So we were like in generations. I got brothers and sisters 20 years older than me. I have nephews and nieces almost my age. So this was one big family of people living on a plantation. And we remain on Merrill's plantation as sharecroppers until 1954, we moved in that house. I was five years old when we moved there. And I was in the cotton field since I was three or four years old. From that place, there was another uh, slave cabin across the road. There were about six more slave cabins along the river scattered here. And then as you go down another mile, there was eight or 10 other slave cabins scattered along another trail. And we would call them turn roads. Uh, you know, it was a little dirt road and there were little cabins spotted all along there. These were all sharecroppers. These were sharecropper families. And the average sharecropper family had eight kids. That's an average. Some had 12, some had 16. And if you had boys, you were much richer because boys could, you know, harvest more cotton than the girls. But the girls were also doing that also. But that was life. Living here on Oakland Plantation, no one lived on Cane River, period. No one lived on the river except sharecroppers. There was nothing along the river but alligators and moccasins and snakes. Nobody from the city wanted to be tied to the river. So it was all here. As we sit here, from here to the other side, there were about 10 cabins like this right in eye shot across the river. They were all full of kids. As you walk down Bermuda Road, there were another 30. As you walk all the way to St. Paul Church, another 30 of these little cabins dotted through the fields. All black people, all sharecroppers living. You would have this being the Bermuda community. I would say you had about close to 300 people in the Bermuda community who was all black. Some of them born here, died here, lived here their whole life. But after the mechanization of farm labor, as the plantation owners made enough money to buy a piece of mechanized equipment, 
So you didn't need them anymore, and you simply just asked them to leave. You would get a knock on the door, say, uh, we no longer need you guys, so by Wednesday, uh, I'm going to remove this cabin to plant more cotton. So you got that time to give up your stuff and you leave. If you had 200 people on your plantation, you bought your first tractor, you lost maybe 20%. You bought your second tractor, you lost another 20%. When you bought your, your cotton machine, you lost 40%, you see? After the, all the big plantations got cotton machines, you had maybe 20% of all the sharecroppers living on the plantation left. Mm -hmm. Now, the only reason why these two slave shacks are still here is that they were domestic workers in the big house. They were guys who learned to drive and operate the machinery, and their families were stayed here but you still had corn harvesting, you had pecans, which was a big operation. But what happened was that people will come down from the city to pick the pecans. Uh, the people on the plantation will maintain in the plantation. So you had maybe 15, 20 people living on the plantation, working to maintain the plantation. But this was a community of black people, a big community. On Saturdays, the boys and girls would meet on the bridge, going back, the store was open, they're going back and forth. Saturday evening, because you worked until about three o'clock on Saturday. And you get off, you know, you, and then you will have maybe 25 cents in your pocket. And you will go, a lot of girls on that side of the bridge and boys, same thing over here. And you would go back and forth, back and forth, and you would meet. The, the store was like the mall. You would go and you would get something and you would walk and you would stand on the bridge and you would holler at girls from over there coming back and forth. So that was like we were at the mall and, and, and that was interesting time. Uh, if you were lucky enough to marry one of the girls from the other side, on this side, you were basically almost stuck here. <laughs> so, so, but most of the, most of the parents would say, uh, you can't date that girl, she's your cousin. And 70% of the time it was true. But they said it to make sure their daughter didn't get stuck on the plantation with a stupid plantation boy. Oh, you can't, no, you can't come and date my girl. Uh, she's your cousin, you know. Like, Tell me how. I said so. <laughs> you know, that's it. But for the most part, these were all families. My mother said to me, if you both call the same people, uncle and auntie, you can't marry her. I don't care if she's your 22nd cousin. I'm going, gee, I'm never going to get a wife around here. <laughs> So it protected a lot of the girls because they wanted their girls to go on to school and to meet other people. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the boys on the plantation were like, what's going to happen to us? You know, Who, who cares? You, you, you're on your own here, but you're not marrying my daughter and taking her down. And the ones who wound up marrying the girls on the plantation. And that's basically what happened. They moved into a place like this and started that same life over again. And that's what the parents were fighting. But growing up here was simply, you got up in the morning at sunlight, uh, you had breakfast and you went to the fields. And at noon, you come out of the fields, you come home, you had your lunch, then you went back to the field. At dusk dark, you came out of the field and you made dinner, you sit on the porch, you had conversations, 
and then you went to bed because you got to get up early in the morning and you do this thing over and over again. For far as going to school, the kids on the plantation didn't get to school until after the crops were in, which was around first week of December. So the kids who were on the plantation, and that were 80% of the kids who went to the black high school, which was down at Melrose, St. Matthew, they would show up in September to register for school in order for the school board to be able to get the funds to keep the school going. But the kids, in reality, didn't show up, back up until the crops were in. So you had about 20% of the kids there, the kids that are too little to go into fields, kids that didn't live on a plantation. They were in the school, and a lot of the girls the parents would send the girls to school, but the boys, they had to work. But for the most part, even with the girls, it was, you know, a couple of days here, a couple of days there, until the crops were in. We were called plantation kids. We showed up with the brogane shoes. We showed up with the flower sack dresses. We showed up with the... Uh, overalls and maybe if we were lucky we got khaki pants out of the crops and we would show up we would be spotted I mean it was like we were different looking people but what really happened once these kids get to school because they had it beat in their brains from their parents is that once you get to school you better learn or you'll be doing this forever well, we know we didn't want to do this forever. So we were there, we were paid attention, we were some of the best students there. And of course the teachers would also keep in touch from the time we registered in, December, in, in September to December, they would keep in touch. They would come by, talk to the parents, talk to the students. Sometimes they would even teach classes to those kids. They would get them together at one having another and try to teach them to try to keep them up because you got to keep them in school because if you didn't the school would lose funding based on student population so you had to keep communicating with them and encourage them okay now when the crops are in you coming back all right okay that usually when the boys got 16 17 years old they if they didn't wind up marrying and starting a family in the middle of the plantation or leaving they would stay in school but I would say 70 percent of the boys left school before the 10th grade but the girls if they didn't get married they stayed in school graduated and they went on but uh, I graduated in 1967 I would say from the time I started school in the first grade until the graduation in 67, uh, we lost 60% of the boys and maybe 10% of the girls from that class. You take the first grade class and the senior class and we lost a lot of them because, you know, it was like, okay, what are you going to do? We can't afford to send you to school. So once you get old enough, you got to work full time on the plantation. and. I, my group was the last group to actually live on a plantation until we graduated. After that, it was total mechanization. Nobody needed you on a plantation. You were uh, forced off the plantation and you were, you know, you went to Nagadish or you went wherever you went to uh, make a living. You, there was no way to make a living on the plantation. But of course, you know, you were gathering pecans and you're coming down here to do the hay, haul the hay and stuff. But usually that was done by the few people that was left on the plantation to maintain the plantation. Now, some of the plantation sharecroppers had big families and they were dedicated to 
being a farmer, sharecropper or whatever, they had enough children, a lot of the families joined in together, and they had enough to buy a couple of mules, to buy a couple of wagons, and to buy some plows. So they got more of the share of the crop, and they was able to be like contractors. They was also able to buy land and become independent contractors. They were not only working their land, they were working parts of other share, other plantation owners' land. It's like, I'll take 25 acres over here, I'll take another 20 over here, plus we're gonna do ours. Most of these people were what you would call Creoles. They had land. Their ancestors were former plantation owners. So when their fathers and mothers died, they were real property. But the black, they got no property. And if you was able to buy some property, it was such a small amount that you weren't gonna make much out of it anyway. That's what you would call a dirt farmer, <laughs> you know. But you still had to go to the plantation to find work to, to basically augment what you were making. And soon as the, the crop prices fell apart, you lost the little land you owned. That was 1965, 66, 67. People think, well, that was, no, that wasn't long ago. Uh, and I don't, I still see a lot of my classmates and the ones who stayed, and most of them are dead. You know, most of the ones who, remain on the plantation with their families after, you know, they were lucky. We called them the lucky ones. Their daddy knew how to drive that tractor, uh, uh, work on that tractor, so they get to stay. I don't know whether that a blessing or what, because they stayed and they took up the trade after their fathers got too old and they were still working on the plantation. But they worked very hard and most of them, I would say 85% of my classmates, men, are dead. I'm 71 and three quarters, but they all died in their 50, late 50s, early 60s. Because that's very backbreaking work. It's hard work. But it's life on a plantation in a nutshell, on any plantation, that was a life. I left Natchitoches in July 1967. And about five years after I left, uh, it was still kind of going on. But by 70, 71, it was all ended. There were no need people coming down here because the plantation were totally mechanized, totally. And some of the big plantation owners were just leasing it to somebody else, as if they're doing now. All the plantations, all the cotton and corn you see now, somebody owns it who manage it from somewhere else, and the real landowner just leases it out to them. Mm -hmm.